Respectable and reliable Consul General of the Philippine Consulate General, the Honorable Adelio Angelito S. Cruz. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our speaker today comes from a family of physicians. His father, Dr. Alberto Jalcita Romualdez Sr., was Secretary General of the World Medical Association, while his mother, Dr. Covadonga Ubante del Cariego, chaired the pathology department of the University of Santo Tomas Hospital. He also comes from a family of public servants. Many of his immediate family members before him served in various important capacities, both in the national and local government. Although coming from a powerful political family, our speaker did not venture fully into public office until his appointment as Philippine ambassador to the United States. He became a media practitioner and a business executive instead. He used to be the chief executive officer of Stargate Media Corporation and publisher of People Asia magazine, an affiliate of the Philippine Star. He was president of the Manila Overseas Press Club and vice president of the Rotary Club of Manila. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is a journalist of the highest caliber. He spent most of his career observing, writing, and even being a critic, if necessary, of the government. If you follow his column in the Philippine Star, his pieces reveal a writer that is as too forthright, trustworthy, and one who has deep understanding of the goings-on in his own country and in the world. His engagements with the government began in 1989 when he served as the media coordinator for the visit of then Vice President Salvador Lavelle to Washington, D.C. He also served as a member of several Philippine business delegations that visited the United States, China, Japan, and New Zealand from 1989 to 2012. Shortly before his nomination as ambassador to the United States, he was designated as a special envoy of the Philippine president of the U.S. He was appointed ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to the United States of America in July 2017 by President Rodrigo Roa Duterte. On November 29, 2017, he presented his credentials to U.S. President Donald J. Trump and formally assumed office as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary. Additionally, as head of the Philippine Embassy in Washington, D.C., he is concurrently the Philippines Emissary to the Commonwealth of Jamaica, Republic of Haiti, Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, Bahamas, Barbados, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. It is worth noting that his appointment came at a time when the Philippines' relationship with the United States, a place that you call home, took a colorful and interesting turn. When our president nominated him for the said position, he was sending a very strong signal that we need business in the United States. Shortly after assuming post, he worked on the first formal meeting between the president, our president, and President Trump in Manila, when we hosted the 31st ASEAN summit in November 2017. More recently, he scored another victory for the Filipinos when the US government, after years of dialogue with the Philippine government, finally decided to return the Balangiga Bells. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. A man of fine diplomatic skills, eloquence, an influencer, and a bridge builder, our speaker has done a tremendous job in steering our relationship with the United States towards the right direction. Born and raised in Manila, he is an alumnus of De La Salle College and an avid golfer. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my boss, our beloved ambassador, His Excellency Jose Manuel Romualdez. Thank you. Please stay, please. 
Well, let me thank first our Consul General. If I have the authority, I'll promote you tomorrow. <laughs> Many of the things that he said uh, are not quite true. Well, in the, in the case of the Palangiga bells, as you know, we've been working for the return of those bells from as far back as 117 years ago when they first took that from the town called Balangiga in summer. But it took the administration of President Duterte who seriously sent the message that we would like to see those bells back. Not only because it was sentimental, but it was important. And luckily, the government of the United States recognized the importance of the relationship that we have that we're promoting mutual respect for each other. And so the return of the belts, which took place last December, was very much welcomed by many Filipinos. Today, 85% of Filipinos trust the United States or see the United States as the most trusted ally. And we're very pleased uh, to serve our country here in Washington, D.C. From uh, the number of associations that we have here in Arizona, I'm, I'm very grateful that you're all here because, you know, I think we have about 500 associations all over the United States, and I think I've received about 300 of them. And so if I just go to each and every one of those associations, I probably will not be doing anything else but to go to those. So my dream is that we will have a Philippine Associations of Associations. <laughs> so that there'll be one umbrella group that we can uh, address. But just the same, I can see that you're all very active uh, community leaders here in this country and in this state of Arizona. And I certainly congratulate all of you for all the stuff, or all the work that you're doing. Let me also recognize our friend, Representative Tony Rivero, for inviting us here to the state of Arizona. Also, Ms. Ethel Lusario Smith, who happens to be a friend of my sister, my younger sister. No, he's actually older. <laughs> and also Dr. James Campbell and Mr. Leonardo Arumin and Marie Cunning and all the other Filipino community leaders here in Arizona and distinguished guests and friends, ladies and gentlemen. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. I have here a 500-page speech, but I'll promise you I'm going to just cut it down. I just wanted to be able to tell you all of the things that uh, we're doing here, not only in Washington, D.C., but also with what's happening in your country, I suppose, your country of birth. And I always tell people, there are two countries that you should never burn your bridges. One is your country of birth and the other one is the United States. This country is a very important country for all of us because this is the icon of where democracy started for us. And we certainly value the friendship that we have in this country. This is actually my first trip ever in the American Southwest. And the only thing I remember about Arizona and Phoenix is the song by Glenn Campbell, By the Time I Get to Phoenix. <laughs> I guess by the time I got to Phoenix, I'm already this old, so. <laughs> but just to say, tomorrow I'll be speaking as the congressman or the representative said that at the state legislature, which is the first for any Filipino official. I will use that platform to talk about the many positive changes sweeping across our nation, as well as to encourage more economic people-to-people -people exchanges between the Philippines and the United States, particularly the state of Arizona. This trip also takes on a special meaning as this is the home state of the late Senator John McCain. Senator McCain was a great and true friend of the Filipinos and a strong champion of the Philippines-U.S. alliance in the U.S. Congress. The Filipino people will always be grateful to him 
for recognizing the importance of our bilateral relationship and doing everything in his power to further develop our ties. I had the privilege of Senator John McCain several times in Washington, D.C., and he had nothing but praise and genuine concern for the Filipino community in your great state. According to the American Community Survey of 2017, there are about 72,000 or 73,000 Filipino American residents in Arizona, or over 32,000 by household count, with the majority working in the field of education and health care. I was also informed by our Consul General Adele Cruz that there are many active Filipino community organizations, like yourselves, founded on business civil, religious, sports, and professional alliances. I am aware that the earliest links we have with Arizona date back to the first Filipino arrivals in the United States, here in Arizona. This was around the period of the Delano Grape Strike and the Manong's movement in the 1960s. Like the farm workers of decades past, present-day Filipino Americans and many other migrant groups are faced with another struggle, this time on immigration. We take some comfort in the knowledge that Filipino Americans are affected by this issue to a lesser degree than other groups. The Migration Policy Institute reports that Filipino Americans in the United States are more likely to go through the normal immigration process, and I quote, are more likely than other immigrants to have strong English skills and have much higher college education rates than overall foreign and U.S.-born populations. They are also more likely to be naturalized citizens than other immigrant groups, which have higher incomes and lower poverty rates and are less likely to be uninsured. This speaks well about our race. My visits to Hawaii, San Francisco, Utah, and many parts of the East Coast validate these findings. It is always heartwarming to hear good words about the Filipino American community anywhere I go here in the United States. In fact, every time I visit a U.S. Congressman or a U.S. Senator in Washington, D.C., we have a lot of issues that we discuss. Some of them are a little bit contentious, but at the end of the day, they always stand up telling me how proud and how happy they are with the Filipino community in their district. And that makes me very proud to be your ambassador there. And so together, you are actually the bridges of understanding with mainstream Americans and with other immigrant communities. I also hope that as the base of your political participation here in the U.S. broadens, you will sustain your political participation in the Philippines also by taking part, perhaps, in the elections. And by the way, I hope we can have somebody like Representative Tony Rivero as a politician in the Philippines. He's a good example of a good politician. <laughs> Just let us know if you decide to become a Filipino citizen, we will give it to you tomorrow. <laughs> For those of you who have registered for overseas voting for the 2019 senatorial and party list elections, elections will start around the middle of April and the last for a month. Please vote if you have a chance to do so, because as dual citizens, you will be able to decide on where you want our country to go or your other country to go. Tomorrow, I will also have the opportunity to speak in front and meet students of the graduating class of Peoria, 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 sorry, Peoria High School. I look forward to the good possibility that I will, that I will be able to meet some of the Filipino American students there. I wish to encourage the Filipino American youth to join the annual Filipino Young Leaders Program also, or FILPRO, a program that will help better understand their Filipino heritage and inculcate in them values that would enhance their potential as future leaders, be it in the Philippines or the United States. PhilPro is an annual program of the Philippine Embassy in Washington, D.C., and all of the Philippine Consulates General across the United States 
are participating with it by sending in their, their candidates. It aims to bring home a group of young Filipino Americans using an itinerary designed to show them what being a Filipino is all about. I hope we will have more candidates from Arizona this coming year. Even with the Filipino community's growing presence here in Arizona, I know that distance and logistical considerations remain a challenge for our consulate here and their team in broadening their engagement with the state and its resident Filipino community. Despite this, you can expect at least two other consular or consular outreach missions on a yearly basis from our consulate general in LA. I must also apologize though that opportunities for me to visit you will not be so often. But nonetheless, I hope that my coming here today will help provide the impetus for closer and deeper Philippine engagement with the government, business community, and the Filipino-American community here in Arizona. I also would like to tell you a little bit about the VIP tour, or the very important Pinoy tour that we have every year. We also call it the Ambassador's Tour. This is held every July of every year, and we invite as many Filipinos, especially the young ones who have never been to their uh, country of uh, their group, those Filipino Americans that were born here but would like to see their country of their parents or their grandparents. That uh, tour is a very educational one because it's extensive, and we have it every year, every November. Dear friends, if there's ever anything at all that you will need from us, you can be sure that we will always be there because that is the mandate that we were given, that our first job here in the United States is to take care of the Filipino community. And that is the job that we will continue to do for as long as we're here. Let me just tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Philippines today. Our country has been dubbed the rising tiger of Asia, with our fast-growing economy outperforming many of our neighbors. The yearly growth of our economy is now at around 6 to 7 percent, which stops the world average of about 3.2 percent. We enjoy the confidence of the international economic community, including foreign investors and trade partners. I am pleased to note that the United States is the Philippines' third largest trading partner and the top destination for our exports. Visitor arrivals from the United States are also ranked third highest in the number. All these fundamentals suggest that our economic relations with the United States will continue to be sustained at a high level, if not improve, in the years to come. President Duterte is also successfully leading the Philippines to a massive infrastructure program called Build, 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 which opens major investment opportunities cutting across many industries. It is a five-year infrastructure development program amounting to about $180 billion, with 75 big infrastructure projects spread out across the Philippine archipelago. In order to fund this ambi our ambitious and vital plan, we have, the government has initiated a comprehensive tax reform program, which we call TRAIN, or called the Tax Reform for Acceleration and Inclusion. In a nutshell, we expect lower and middle income households to have greater purchasing power and a smaller share of the tax burden. Our tax system would be fairer and more efficient, and our infrastructure projects will be sufficiently funded. This ambitious project or this infrastructure program will hopefully ease out the traffic in not only Metro Manila, but will encourage people to move to the other areas in provinces like Bohol, where Dr. Kapel comes from. It is now fast developing. In fact, in Bohol alone, just to tell you, tourism has gone up so high that I remember a friend of mine who bought his property there for something like 150 or 250 pesos not too long ago. Today it goes for something like 25 to almost 50,000 per square meter, which gives you an idea that there is really a lot of economic activity going on right now all over the country 
not only in Bohol, but in many parts where we hope to be able to develop it with this massive infrastructure program that has been initiated. And by the way, the first subway system in Metro Manila is already on stream, and hopefully, when you do come and visit, you'll be able to at least go around a little faster than maybe three hours per trip. <laughs> maybe this time one hour. That's true. A government's primary commitment is to protect its law-abiding citizens and against lawlessness and criminality that threaten their very existence. I know that there's been a lot of, uh, of publicity surrounding the drug war that the president has, has embarked, but I can tell you that as a media person that I've been observing the country for so many years, in fact, 40 years now, I have never seen anything like what we're doing right now. The drug situation, of course, which is also very prevalent here in the United States, is really a big problem that must be solved one way or the other, because it can destroy a country. And just to give you just a small microcosm of the problem that I feel we've been able to improve because of this, is the criminality in Manila alone. There is a street in Manila called Leverisa Street. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. This is in Malate District where I, was, where I grew up. And that area is an area where not too many people can go around after 9 o'clock at night or maybe even earlier than that. And this is going on for years because it was like a drug drug. Today, and this was verified by many people and I myself not too long ago went there, it is a light it, and people can actually move around even up to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. This is an example of what crime, like drugs, can do. It can change overnight by just simply making the, the streets safer. And so that's one of those that I think is a clear example of why uh, this kind of intensive campaign to get rid of this menace not only around the world, but more importantly, in the streets of Metro Manila. And of course, as we all know, terrorism and drugs go hand in hand. And we were able to prove that in Mindanao when there was an accidental raid in Marawi City, where actually drugs were the ones that were put the resources in the hands of this so-called terrorist leaning groups and we were able to quash it. There are many of these cases that I feel that uh, will be said or talked about. By the end of the day, it is when you see what's going on in the country and see the transformation that takes place, then you'll probably see that there is really something that's, at the very least, moving forward. These are all concrete validations of our country's long tradition of promoting. Also, we would like to say we do uphold human rights, which is in harmony with the governance and development model. As your ambassador, I, along with the rest of the Philippine Foreign Service, continue to be guided by the principles laid out by the President as we are preserve our long-standing alliance and gain new friends all over the world. That is why we will continue to be an equal partner and ally of the United States while developing new friendships. We intend to remain friends to all and enemies to none. In the most pressing of times, the United States is also our most cherished and reliable partner. The support of the United States was key in our success in liberating, as I said, Marawi City from the clutches of the local ISIS-affiliated groups in 2017. I was so moved by the rapid response by the United States when we asked them to help us, especially in the Typhoon Haiyan, which happened in the province of my father, Leite. It was such a moving thing that I wrote a column entitled, God Bless America. Because that day, thousands of lives were saved when the United States sent its USS George Washington, and they were able to save thousands where already 10,000 have died, but hundreds more were saved 
because of the resources of the USS George Washington. And so, my friends, the truth is that you are all part of this intricate tapestry of Philippines-US relations, which spans many generations. Despite the ebbs and flows that come our way, this tapestry is tightly bound and unbreakable. Allow me to close by assuring you that it has been a wonderful experience to be with you today, and my time with you will definitely be a highlight of my visit, and you can be assured that you have a friend in Washington, D.C. Thank you.